Our text this morning is Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and uh, really the point we want to look at is in uh, verse 8, we're asking the question this morning, where should we do missionary work? Let me read or begin by reading Acts 1, verses 1 through 8. Luke writes, the first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. By the way, let me just point out again that uh, Luke, as you know, wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. He talks about his first account as those things Jesus began to do and teach because it was just the beginning. The completion of it is actually recorded here in the book of Acts and in the rest of the New Testament of what Jesus continued to do through his church. Now we understand that he's already completed his work of giving us his word. We do have a complete testimony. We have uh, everything the Lord intends to reveal to us, at least verbally. But Jesus has not completed his work of gathering his sheep. So Jesus, even today, continues to do that work, but he does it uh, through us. Now, Horatius Bonner, a uh, Scottish Presbyterian, very evangelistically oriented, certainly a kindred spirit, a man filled with God's Holy Spirit, uh, once wrote in his preface to a work by John Gillies, which is something I think we would all benefit from reading if we had the time called historical collections relating to remarkable periods of the success of the gospel. I'm sure it had a longer title than that, but in those days the title was really a description of the book. But in this book, Horatius Bonner gives to us a very affecting image of the spiritual condition that this world is in and whom the Lord is going to use to reach out to it. Now, I've read this before, but every time I read it, I'm just I'm struck by it. I find it to be very enlightening in many ways. This is what he writes. The world is still sleeping. It's sleep of death. It has been a slumber of many generations, sometimes deeper, sometimes lighter, yet still a slumber like that of the tomb, as if destined to continue until the last trumpet sound and then there shall be no more sleep. Yet God has not left it to sleep on unwarned. He has spoken in a voice that might reach the dullest ears and quicken the coldest heart. Ten thousand times has he thus spoken, and still he speaks. But the world refuses to hear. Its myriads slumber on, as if this sleep of death were the very blessedness of its being. Yet in one sense, the world's sleep has never been universal. Never has there been an age when it could be said there is not one awake. The multitude has always slept, but there has always been a little flock awake. Even in the world's deepest midnight, there have been always children of the light and of the day. In the midst of a slumbering world, some have been in every age awake. God's voice had reached them and his mighty power had raised them, and they walked the earth, awake among the sleepers, the living among the dead. Now Bonner reminds us that most in this world are sleeping. They are without life spiritually. 
they came into this world dead to God, hating God, wanting nothing to do with God or with his gospel. They are on their way to judgment and they don't even care. Now, who are these people? Well, Bonner reminds us that there are the people who are all around us. They're in our homes, some of them, in our neighborhoods, in the places where we work. Many of them actually go to church and are members of churches. There's a lot of people sleeping this sleep of death. But again, he reminds us that there are also at the same time those who are awake. Those who have heard God's voice in the gospel. Who have been raised by his power. Who are alive among the dead. Awake among the sleeping. And of course, they are the ones alone who can warn those who are sleeping, whom the Lord alone is going to use to reach them. Now, who are these people that are awake? Well, they are you and they are me and they are everyone who has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last time we looked at the answers to a few simple questions. What is a missionary? A missionary is one who was sent sent by Christ to communicate the good news of the gospel to others. We saw that it doesn't refer only to those who do this cross-culturally in foreign missions. We asked the question, whom is the Lord sent to do missionary work? Well, we saw that he didn't give this work to a select, elite, specially gifted group of believers, but he gave this task to the whole church, including you and me. And we ask the question, why should we do missionary work? Well, we should do it not only because the Lord has given us this responsibility, but also because of love, because of what he gave to us. He gave that which was most precious to him. He sent his son to, to live and to die so that we might live. Jesus came and he laid down his life for us. We should do this because of his love for us and because we love the Father and the Son and want to honor them. We should do it because this is how the Father has basically ordered things so that he would have a reward to give to his Son. We are the ones whom he has trusted the responsibility of gathering the sheep together, those sheep that Jesus is going to receive as a reward. We should do it because it's a joy and a privilege to bring the gospel to others. You know, if the medical field came up with a drug that could cure every ill, could stop the aging process and make you young again, I think you as well as I would, if we were entrusted with this medication, would gladly tell others about it. Well, how much more when the Lord has freely promised to give everyone heaven instead of hell if they will only trust in his son. How much more should we share this good news because it's far greater than uh, the news of any medication that might be able to do what I've mentioned. You know, the Lord could have given this honor to his angels and his angels would have gladly done it. They would have been thrilled to do it. They would have been honored to have been chosen to do this. But the Lord chose instead to give this honor to us, the honor of sharing that good news. We should also do missionary work, we saw, because it's the only way that those whom we care about, our children, our parents, our family members, our friends and our neighbors, it is the only way that they can ever escape hell. The message of the gospel is the only message God uses to save. And we are the only ones we should do it because we're the only ones who can do this. We are the only ones who are awake among those who are dead. We are the only ones who know the danger that they are in and have the means to do something about it. We have the gospel and we're the only ones who do have it. Now with, with this in mind, I'd like for us to look at two more questions regarding missionary work this morning. The first one is in the title, where should you do, where should I do missionary work? And the second one is when, when should you and I do it? Well, first of all, where should you do missionary work? And I think the answer to that question is quite obvious. The answer is everywhere. 
Do it everywhere. Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew 29, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. He says in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. Now one thing we do need to understand that when Jesus tells us that we are to disciple every nation, that he doesn't necessarily have in mind what we usually think Go and make disciples of Russia, go make disciples of Poland, go make disciples of Uganda, Cuba, etc. He, he's not basically saying, for one, in one sense, make disciples out of these nations, but disciple these nations. But another point I want to bring out is this, is that nations are not defined in Scripture by geographical boundaries. They are defined by languages and cultures, and each geographically you know, uh, delineated nation may have several people groups in it, several cultures. I mean, just look at our nation, how multicultural we are. Literally, the Lord wants us to reach out to every society and to every people group and to reach all of them with the gospel. I think we understand that that's what our Lord wants us to do. Now that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? So where should we start? Well, where we are is actually a very good place to start because the Lord put us where we are for a particular reason. Jesus tells us in our text this morning in Acts 1.8, You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, I want you to notice here, first of all, that Jesus, what he says here, isn't really technically a command. Rather, it is a statement. He's not telling his disciples what it is, basically, they must do, but he's telling them what it is they will do. And yet, it still has the force of a command because it is something that the Lord Jesus has already told them to do, and it is something that will actually take place. You shall be my witnesses. Actually, that's pretty encouraging, because we've already seen the Lord has given us his spirit as well. And he's already told us that you shall be my witnesses as well. We, we will be witnesses. Of course, the point is we want to be good witnesses. But Jesus, in this statement, also tells them how it is that they're going to carry out the Great Commission. They're going to start where they are, in Jerusalem, and work their way out from there. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what they did. Now, this work particularly or especially moved forward when the Lord called the Apostle Paul, who with his companions, as you know, reached the entire world the whole Roman Empire, even in their day. We know that since their day, the gospel has gone even farther. It's come over to the Americas through colonization, reaching uh, not only, of course, um, many different cultural groups uh, here who have colonized, but even those Native Americans, as we saw last week through the work of David Brainerd and others. It's gone to other parts of the world as well. This evening we're going to see that it reached India through the work of William Carey. And according to the word of the Lord, eventually it is going to reach all of creation. So Jesus says, start where you, begin, start where you are and work out from there. And eventually the whole earth is going to be filled. Now what does this tell us about where we should start? Well, again, the gospel has reached us. But we do need to recognize that we, you know, not everybody in our culture and, and in our city and in our place knows it. So we need to begin where we are as well. There's no better place to begin than where the Lord has already put you. Now, have you ever met anybody who wanted to do missionary work, but they wanted to do it somewhere else? They wanted to do it in a foreign country? Uh, I've met people like that. I perhaps even thought that way. Maybe you've thought that way. That it's going to be easier to do it somewhere else than right here. It's easier to evangelize in another country where nobody knows you. You know, there's that kind of mystery that's shrouded around you from another culture. And I think we understand something about that. But do you know that the opposite is really the case? 
that it's actually more difficult to communicate in foreign countries because of the barriers that exist between you and them. If you can't communicate in your own country, in your own culture, with your own language, where there are relatively few barriers standing between you and your audience, and really we only have one here, and that is the fact that our audience is asleep, they're dead, in trespasses and sins. But don't forget, the Lord can and He will awaken them. And He will raise them to life through the gospel. If we can't do it in our own culture and in our own language group, we're going to have a much more difficult time when you add the barrier of language and the barrier of culture. It is undeniably true. It's not easier over there. It's actually easier for us here. And the Lord tells us that we need to begin where we are before we move on to other areas. So let me suggest that we begin, first of all, in our homes. Evangelize those in your household. If your spouse doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, share the gospel with him. Share the gospel with her. Pray that the Lord would save them and convert them. Teach your children about the good news of Christ. And by the way, I'd apply that to your children at any age. But particularly when they're young. Give them a good foundation for their lives. Urge them to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from their sins. It's not a done deal that your children, because they're born in your household, are going to be saved. I hear that a lot. It's not the case. We must evangelize them. They have to trust in Jesus Christ. They have to be born again. And the only means God uses to bring that about is the gospel. So evangelize them and pray that the Lord would grant them mercy and that he would breathe his life into their souls and transform them by the power of the gospel, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've already got that pretty much underway, begin to branch out to more extended family members. Jesus did say on one occasion that a prophet has no honor except, or I should say he has honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives. A prophet has no honor in his hometown and among his relatives. But Jesus did not mean by that not to attempt to reach out to them. Our Lord Jesus evangelized them as well as anyone else. And even those in his own household, even his own brothers, which we know were stepbrothers, eventually trusted in him. Jesus knew he would have difficulties with them, but he didn't turn away from them on, a, on that account. He still sought to evangelize them. Now from there, you can work out into your neighborhoods. Try to build relationships. Try to build bridges with your neighbors in which you can share Jesus. You know, it's, it's difficult really to effectively or effectively to share Jesus Christ with people that you don't even know. You have to build some kind of relationship with them in order to gain a hearing. So try to build those relationships. At the same time, think about reaching out to those people with whom you work because undoubtedly you've already established relationships with some of them. Try to exploit that relationship in a good way. Exploitation is usually looked at as a bad thing, but we can, we can exploit it in a good sense. Use the relationships you've already built to communicate Jesus Christ. Use those relationships you built in the past, maybe friends you haven't seen in a long time, but again, particularly those that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. Bear in mind that your audience, whoever they may be in your households, in your neighborhoods, in your extended families, in your workplace, if they have never heard the gospel and if they never repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, God says, Jesus says that they are going to suffer when they die for the rest of time. And you never know exactly when it is they're going to die. I mean, who would have thought a little child who's seven and a half years old was going to die on the day in which he died? If this doesn't show us anything else, it shows us that death comes unexpectedly. I think we all understand that. We need to share the gospel with people while they're alive because once they're dead, it's too late. There are no second chances after death. It is appointed unto man once to die 
And then comes the judgment. Now, sharing the gospel with them doesn't guarantee that they're going to be saved. I think we understand that as well. But not sharing the gospel with them almost guarantees that they won't be saved. Now, sure, somebody else can share the gospel with them. We can always, you know, we can always shift that responsibility to that person we don't know and we don't know whether they're going to come into their life or not and we can think that person's going to do it. But one thing we have to realize is this. If the God has given you into their lives already as a witness and has given you the call to do it, he may not have appointed any others to bring the gospel to them. We want to be the means of the salvation of the people around us. We don't want to be the means of their not coming to Christ by not sharing the gospel with them. Now again, if you've already done this, then you can work your way out towards other neighborhoods. And it really depends at this point on the Lord's calling on your life and the opportunities that he providentially, sovereignly brings into your life. Now, obviously, we need to balance this work with the other responsibilities that the Lord has given to us, but we must never allow the other responsibilities to crowd this one out. This is essential to the Lord's work. This is primarily what it is He wants us to do. As we saw last week, this is why we're here in the world, why the Lord redeemed us, is that we might be the light of the world. Now let's not forget as well that in today's world you don't have to travel very far to reach other language and cultural groups. I mentioned a little bit earlier that we are a multicultural society. I mean, not only do we have, of course, the internet, which we can use to reach every country and everybody who has access to the web, many, many different groups, people groups, have already migrated, have emigrated here to this nation. I mean, we, it's like the Lord is bringing people in so that we can share the gospel with them. There is so much that we can do in our own country. As a matter of fact, I understand Christians, churches in some countries are sending missionaries to us. We used to be the ones sending out the missionaries, but now they're sending missionaries to us because of our current condition. There's really a lot of work to do right here. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do foreign missions, but what I am saying is there's a lot we can do right here. We don't have to go to another country. And we do need to begin, as Jesus told us, where we are. So where should we do missionary work? Well, begin where you are and work your way out. But the second question is this, when should you do missionary work? I think that's another obvious answer to that question, isn't it? If you're not already doing it, you need to begin right now. Jesus has already given us the command. As his servants, it's not up to us when we will obey it. If we're not obeying it, we need to repent. And we need to begin doing it now. We should do our best at all times, to be ready at all times for the opportunities that God gives us. We should always be armed with the gospel and filled with the Spirit and ready to do this work. Again, remember what Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 16. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Now Peter was writing this to a group of believers who were going to share the gospel with Jews whom, as you know, were, were very apt to, uh, to extreme reactions. He says, don't fear their intimidation. And even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. But always be ready. Always be ready. Now, I believe that if we sincerely seek the Lord every single day, for the help of His Holy Spirit to be ready, 
and for the opportunities to share the gospel that we will likely find both in the course of the day. Sometimes people will ask you, as you live the Lord Jesus Christ in front of you, as you are shining His lights in the world, as you are living epistles read by all men, people are going to ask you. But I think most often you're going to need to try to get those inroads. You are going to need to ask them questions. You are going to need to tell them. Now, that wouldn't be really that difficult to do if certain things are true about you and about me. As long as Jesus is not at the center of our lives, as long as we're not armed with this purpose to share the gospel, in other words, going out thinking, having that at the front of our minds at all times, can I share the gospel today? Where are the opportunities the Lord's going to give me? I've got to be ready when those opportunities come. If you're not living openly as a Christian, this is going to be hard. But if he is at the center of your life, if you are committed and armed with the purpose to evangelize, if you are living openly as a believer and not as a closet Christian, because then you've got to come out of the closet and try to share it as well as share it, if the person, in other words, already knows that you are a believer and you're living the life of a Christian, the gospel will then naturally flow from your life. You won't need gimmicks. You won't need the, the bait and switch techniques. You won't you know, need to do the, uh, what do you call them, the um, uh, census or the uh, particular um, you know, things that are used to open up that door. I'm, I can't think of the word right now. You're not going to have to force it into the conversation or trick people into conversation. All you're going to have to do is just simply share what is already in your heart and already on your mind. Now, I think being ready to share the gospel at all times is simply part of what it means to redeem the time that the Lord has given to you as a part of the stewardship that he has entrusted to you. It's one of those resources, one of those treasures that God has entrusted to you and something you need to use wisely because one day you and I are going to be asked by the Lord to give an account for our lives. Now, thankfully, by God's grace and the blood of Christ, he's going to have removed all the imperfections from our lives and all that's going to be left is what we did for the Lord. But what we did is going to be examined on that day and there's either going to be a lot or a little and thankfully, even if all of our works are burned up, the Lord tells us, I believe Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we will still be saved by the grace of Christ. But I think you would admit, as well as I, you don't want to stand before the Lord on that day empty-handed. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16, Therefore, be careful how you walk, how you live, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of your time because the days are evil. Time is, is precious. It's, it's very precious. We only have so much of it and no more, and we don't even know how much we even have to begin with. One thing is sure. There's nothing we can do about the time that we have already lost, but we can do something about the time that we still have Left, And I can't think of a better way to use it. I can't think of a wiser way to use it than, try, than using it to try to save people who will go down into hell for eternity unless they hear the gospel and unless they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. I can't think of a better way of using that time. <clears throat> you know, I don't think Spurgeon could think of a better way of using that time either. And I think you would agree that Spurgeon would agree, especially when we read the things that Spurgeon wrote as we do from week to week. Spurgeon was all about saving souls. And it was something he was trying to communicate to his, his not his audience, but his congregation. On the Lord's Day as he preached, he, he expected, as the Lord expected, all of his people to be engaged in this and that's one of the reasons why Spurgeon's church was the size that it was. That wasn't the only reason. <clears throat> the Lord did particularly gift Spurgeon, particularly bless Spurgeon and use Spurgeon. But this is what they were about. 
William Carey, I think, would certainly agree with this, as we're going to see this evening. One of the quotes included in the back of the, of the bulletin this morning is this. Is not the commission of our Lord still binding upon us? Can we not do more than now we are doing? It seems to me that Carey was earnestly seeking the Lord. He was filled with the Spirit. He had the burden of Christ on his heart. And he wanted to do what his Lord wanted him to do. This is the kind of mindset that we need to have if we're going to reach out to others. And so may the Lord help us to understand, again, the calling that the Lord has placed upon us, the Great Commission. May he help us to understand, of course, all the, all the motives he's already given to us, where it is we should begin and when we should begin. There are souls at stake, we need to understand. There are people who may very well end up in hell. It's once been said, you know, that we, we don't want people to go to hell because of us. We always want it to be in spite of us. We've tried everything that we possibly can. We're using the means God has given to us. We're reaching out with the gospel. We're, we're um, not being intimidated, not being ashamed to own Jesus Christ in front of others but we are open with it if that person perishes he perishes because he well because of his sin but not because we weren't willing to share the gospel with him let's pray that God would give us that boldness would give us that courage would give us that burden that love for Jesus and that love for others and that power of the Holy Spirit that will give us that love that we might bring the gospel to others and see them saved well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would, would help us to do that.